the Spirit that we ask things. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Chris. I just want to say that I'm so grateful to God. I know each of us are. Gordon, I'm not funny. Okay? You have a gift. You know? Well, I'm funny looking. I, um, <laughs> I look at my giftedness and it's kind of a weird thing, you know, I'm part scrounger. You know, it's a part of my gift of giving. But um, I'm a storyteller. But I'm not a hair kind of storyteller who, or a Bryce kind of storyteller. I'm a troubadour. I'm the guy that will sit on a bench under, under some fair damsel's window and serenade. I'm, I'm just, that's... If you're that. a troubadour, who's a falsebador? Oh, boy. Uh, I, I knew the puns would be, will, will, will come out thick and thin in this series. Um, but I love story. I do. We, uh, we begin our kids' outreach at Stetzer tomorrow. And it's an introductory meeting with half a dozen or so kids. And we're going to talk about how to tell stories and how to do interviews and how to record stories and all that kind of fun stuff. And, um, but there's nothing more power, powerful than a redemptive story. There's all kinds of stories. Every, stories everywhere. You know, there's, every movie's a story. They tell me there's about 12 different plots, and that's about all there is in history. Um, every TV show is a story. Every book is a story. Every commercial is a story, so I'm not so good. The Bible is not just a story, but it's a real story. It's a real story of lives of people. It's a story of God's redemptive plan to bring us to him, to reestablish what was broken. As we encounter God, I don't know what's going on with this microphone this morning. It's dropping out. But um, as we experience or encounter God, each of us has a burning bush. Maybe it's on a mountaintop, maybe it's in a valley, maybe it's a crossroad. But all of our stories come, if you have met Christ, where you have been changed for eternity. Recently, we, uh, Sunday nights are kind of a special time for my wife and I. It's not a date night per se, but it's a movie night. We either make a pizza, order a pizza, make some popcorn, and we watch a movie. And then we talk about the movie. It's just our kind of, we've always done that, you know, even when we had kids. Yeah, living at home. But um, recently we watched the uh, Jesus Revolution. And boy, did it bring back memories. Because I got saved in the 70s. Yes. And boy, the clothes, the relationships, the, the cultural issues that were going on at that time in history. Um, Boy, it brought back taste, sounds, smells, thoughts that, you know, you live through. But there was something unique about that time that most of my generation were truth seekers. We were looking for truth. We were looking for a deeper understanding. We were looking for answers. And in the truest sense, we were seekers. In our journey, we grapple with our sin. Uh, you know, it's, it's, someone says that we need to preach sin a lot. Well, we do to a certain point. But I have met very few people who, even those who are the most wicked of the sinners and the most in, encapsulated in, in their sin, will come to admit that, yeah, we are sinners. We're all broken. Yes, our mama at some point in time has dropped all of us on our heads. It's just true. You can't escape that. You know and you know that you know and you're knower that you're broken. What you do with that is a whole different story, but the fact of the matter is that as Romans 3.23 says, for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. I remember the uh, service that I came to Christ. The guy was talking about his father's tackle box. 
and uh, in his father's tackle box that there were the knives that he used to cut bait and the rags that he used to clean his, his, his stuff. And he talked about how all of our righteousness is filthy rags. And boy, it came, and I grew up in a, in a, in a Chrysler household, you know, in a Mopar household. And all my family, except for me, was gifted with motors. And my dad had toolboxes, but he also had this box of rags that he used to clean his tools. And when that preacher was talking about how all of our righteousness is filthy rags, boy, bang, right to my mind, was right there to the right lower hand side of my dad's tool bench was the rag box. All of us are on a journey. All of us know that we're coming from that kind of a broken place. So begins my story. Every redemptive story has a before. Where were you at before you met God? Then it talks about, you know, the middle, about what was my God encounter? What did God use to bring me to the acknowledgement of truth? And then there's the rest of the story. What God has continually to do thereafter. And that's kind of the pattern for all, the, all this next series. And hopefully, and Lord willing, you will get to the end of this series and be able to share your story. Are you coming to uh, do something with my... Uh, you're coming to change my microphone thingy before I get to... Well, I'll take a break. Good commercial. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> As somebody said last uh, Friday night at the film festival, as somebody said during the film festival, a pastor in his church once said, technology's not our friend. It, it's, it's so true. Um, talking about the beginning of story, and... Come on down. Come join us. Beginning of the story. I'm reminded, uh, my buddy Dave Weiss, who's a storyteller and artist, uh, wrote a review of the new movie, The Blind, uh, which is uh, Phil, and, Phil, Phil Robinson and Miss Kay, their story of, their, their redemptive story. And I'm, I'm reminded of the fact, and that, by the way, the Jesus Revolution movie actually... Do, do you, have you seen the shift in Christianity where there was a time where we glanced over the sin? We glanced over the sad... We only wanted the happy story. What did God do? Well, I'm, I really believe that we don't talk about what we did to get to what God had to do. And, and, and if we start focusing on the fact that there's a relatability... The thing about the Jesus Revolution and what Dave was sharing for the blind, and I want I recommend go see the blind. It, it's 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 a little dark in the beginning, but it's so true that we need to be talking about the fact that I was broken, I was a sinner, I was messed up, and I needed a savior. And I say all this to say this: don't hold back, because the very thing. The very thing about your story that people will identify with the most is what they can identify with. Because they haven't met Jesus yet. Most people, most people have never been to Sunday school. They think David and Goliath is that old cartoon on TV. <laughs> Yo, Davy! You know, the dog and, and the little boy, they don't, they, ha they don't know anything about the Lamb of God. Not to redeem, but the fact of the matter is what did God used to get my attention. For me, it was peace. Peace was my problem. That was the what that drew the why in my life. I, I have said this for years. I said, you know, I was a very talented kid. I grew up in a wonderful home. You know, I was no different than most. But I had a little bit more than most, I guess. But I could be in a room full of people and feel totally empty and alone. And I was in music and the arts. and I was always in a room of 50 to 100 people. 
but I was always alone. You see, peace with God, there's a spiritual peace. And it's the most important. It affects everything else. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, God sent Christ to make peace between himself and us. We needed to be reconnected. And Christ was the agent of transfer. God doesn't want you to live disconnected from him. But peace with God doesn't come from something we do. Peace with God comes from something Jesus Christ did. Amen? He also brings peace within. Now the Bible has a word for this. It's an emotional peace. And I lack that emotional standing in my life. It's called the peace of God. And the peace of God, you get when you have the peace. You have the peace of God when you have the peace of... Oh, let me rephrase this. You, got it. You, got it. You, you know what I'm saying? Um, Colossians says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. God wants his peace to rule in our lives. That Hebrew word is shalom. Do you know what trans that word peace comes up 790 times in the Bible? Wow. For those who have a broken heart, God gives us a comforting peace. For those with a confused heart, he gives us a guiding peace. For those who have a sh heart of shame, he gives us a forgiving peace. When we have a worried heart, he gives us a confident peace. The fact of the matter is we are reconnected to him through having the peace of God. And it fills you with all joy. Now, as I said, my life was no different than many of you. On the surface, I seemed happy and fortunate. I, I was blessed. I, I grew up with a love of music. I had parents who encouraged the journey. My mom, a wee bit too much, she at one point was really living vicariously through all three of her kids who were musically talented. It was just how she was wired, and she was very driven, and we became very driven. Um, but there was a darker undercurrent. I looked happy. I sounded happy. I was gifted. I was doing lots of cool things. I had so many opportunities. I studied with a couple jazz greats. I mean, literally, I mean, who gets to hang out for three hours once a week with somebody who toured with Benny Goodman and, and Stan Kenton and Harry James and knew them by name and told you all the old stories and, you know, I just, I mean, I grew up, I was so fortunate and blessed and my parents were ballroom dancers and they took me to Sunnybrook. I was the little kid with a Coca-Cola with a little bow tie and the cute little suit sitting there by the stage. And slowly as the evening would go on, I would sneak up onto the stage and backstage and hang out with the musicians. And I had, I, I looked like I just had this blessed thing going on. But the fact is that I lacked peace. As a little kid, I suffered abuse by someone who was a trusted family member. I became very protective, very withdrawn. I was angry. I was empty. On the surface, I was sort of selfish with relationships. Got me into trouble more than once. I wanted to be accepted. I wanted... I had to suppress the hurt because I had this void in my heart, this emptiness. And this emptiness just was like these warring factions going back and forth in my heart. I went to church. It was that thing. You know, in our generation, if you're in your 50s and 60s, as a little kid in the 60s and 70s, you went to church. It was just the thing you did. I remember the day my dad stopped going to church because he got offended by something. Until my father's dying day, he would never tell me what caused him to stop going to church, but he stopped going. But mom kept us going. The struggles that I had at church were two. One, what they preached, they didn't exactly live. The second thing was they, did, they preached a works gospel. I could never, no matter how hard I tried to do the heavy lifting that I needed for the emotional and the peace that I was really seeking to be formed in my life. Because it's not by works as we know. The, the crossroad for me was the being fed up with the hypocrisy of saying one thing from the pulpit, saying one thing in Sunday school, saying one thing at the youth retreats and not living it the rest of the time. 
That drove me from God. That drove me from church by the time I went to college. The death nail for me in church was twofold. One, my youth leader left. I love the guy. We're still friends. He's, he's close to 90 now, and we're still friends to this day. But he left the church. When he left, there was an incredible void left by a lot of negativity. He was truly saved. Later on, we talked a whole lot about that. But at the time, there was that void. Second thing happened, I mentioned that I was in music and I was gifted. And our choir director of some 30 years passed away unexpectedly. And the pastor and a couple um, trustees in the church encouraged me as this young guy who was under scholarship and going off to, to music school should apply for the church choir director position. So I did and I thought I nailed it. You know, the organist was a music teacher. We had two or three different music teachers in the choir. It was a really good choir. And I thought, wow, this will be a cool opportunity for me to, to learn my skills, cultivate my gifts, and at the same time make a little money on the weekend because it paid five grand a year. And in 1975, five grand a year wasn't too shabby for a kid, you know, in college. But I got a letter that angered me. And the pastor called me and he wanted to thank me. Now, he was the one that said, from the pulpit, young people should be excited about serving the Lord and jumping at any opportunity that came their way to serve God. And he said to me, I want to thank you because so-and-so in the choir, we really wanted. And we got him $3,000 cheaper because you applied. And I felt used and kicked to the curb. And that was the last little bit of hypocrisy I couldn't stomach. And I walked away. It's funny how final straws have a way of cascading trouble. I got off the school and I was in music school and it was conservatory and I had some gifts and talents and I realized very quickly that I wasn't as gifted and talented as I really thought I was or I was told I was. I realized that my education didn't prepare me for my furthering of my education. I discovered that emotionally I wasn't ready for real life because I went from a little pond to a very big ocean overnight. And it was tough. I thrived in some areas. I thrived with some uh, relationships. But for the first time, at the, at the same time, for the first time, I was avoiding faith life. And I got into, well, let's just say some unsavory sorts in the music world. Alcohol became a regular thing. By my second semester as a freshman, drugs had become a part of my life where I was taking pills to get up in the morning. I was, you know, doing 20 credits and playing in, a, in three musical groups and traveling and touring. And it was pills to get me up in the morning and fifth, a fifth of Jack Daniels to get me to bed at night after I studied. And it got to this place where I felt so hollow, I felt so empty, and I felt so alone that on my sixth floor of my, door, I actually, of my dorm, I actually looked out the window, pressed my hands against the screen and thought one night, should I just jump? Well, I realized fairly quickly, in the midst of all this, being alone wasn't healthy. So I started hanging out with some groups, and uh, I, was, I was blessed. I, academically, I started to turn some things around because I started to hang out with some incredibly gifted, talented, smart people. I started to room with some world-class musicians who were really straight-laced. They weren't into anything in, in devices, but I did improve my wit, and I did improve my sarcasm, but I was still empty. And they encouraged me, why don't you go to crew? I went to Campus Crusade. And to my shock and on my all, on Thursday night, we got high on Jesus. And then Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, the same group of students were getting high on everything else. And the hypocrisy just, it was just like, you know, I, I got to this place where I was, get, I was paid 50 bucks as a brass player to show up in a brass quintet to play in church on Sunday. You paid me, I, I performed. But I was there under duress. There better be coffee. Well, something happened. My ritual at that point in time, my uh, sophomore year, I was going uh, home on Sunday nights. And I was, I was living... Um, 
I did laundry on Sunday nights, and I watched 60 Minutes. And it was my dog, Kibby, and me, and we, we, you know, I make myself a beverage, and I sit there and fold laundry and watch 60 Minutes. Well, one night I lost it. There was this episode of these kids that Harry Reasoner was interviewing, and it was all about how I found it. They had these big buttons, they had bumper stickers, yes. and they were talking about how they found it. And I sat there and yelled at the TV, you bunch of hypocrites. I had lost it, I'm cussing God out. I'm literally, there was words as, I'm a Teamster kid growing up, and I knew the words from age five, and I was using them. And I was addressing God, personally. I was having my R-rated moment, like David did in, in the Psalms, and I called God out. I said, that's a bunch of hooey. If you're real, prove it. If not, shut up and never say another word to me. You don't do that to God, ever. You never say, God, prove it. Because guess what? He proves it. It's real. We play with live ammo, ladies and gentlemen. There is an enemy. There is a devil. He is real. There is a spiritual world of good and evil. The presence of evil is just the absence of God in some circumstances. Well, the next six months changed my life. And here's where the story gets interesting. Every day, somebody witnessed to me. Every single day for six months. And here's the scary, weird thing. There were days where somebody picked up where somebody else left off. And they didn't know each other. And they had never met each other. But God was trying to get my attention. I go to my music lesson, and there'd be a track sitting there. A long hallway. There's a track. No other track, just outside the room I'm waiting to go into. And if I didn't read it, it stayed there. I was going twice a week for lessons. And, you know, it would be there for the third time and go, okay, I'm going to read it. And I would read it. And I would put it back down. And guess what? A new track would appear the very next time. But there's nobody. There's no cameras. There's nobody in the hallway. How do they know that I read it? It was God. Went to a family reunion. My Aunt Betty, I loved my Aunt Betty. She had this little Pennsylvania Dutch accent and a little squeaky little voice. And they were big supporters of Liberty University. And their daughter, had got my cousin, my cousin, uh, had gone there, and, and uh, she cornered me at the family reunion and gave me Jesus. And I was nice and I was sweet because I really loved my Aunt Betty, but I wasn't ready yet for Jesus. I found this track one day that somebody handed me that said Romans 6.23b, talking about the consequences of sin for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, that festered for three or four days. And then somebody gave me another track. Romans 5.8. And it said this, But God demonstrates his love towards us while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is the kind of material that is being handed to me every two or three days, along with people witnessing to me. Well, I had stopped all my activities that summer and got a summer job making deliveries for a lumber yard. And as I went every day, I made a delivery. You know, in the morning, somebody went this to me in the afternoon. Somebody, there were days that somebody picked up where the other person left off. It was just, I got to this place where I was sitting in the truck one day. I made a delivery to a church. I met this organist, this guy, Jimmy. He invited me to a cantata. And as I'm driving out of the church parking lot, I just, I pulled to the stop sign and I just put my head down. I said, Maybe there's just something to this thing about being saved. Well, I went to church that day. First time in probably a year. Place was packed. My, my future wife was there. She was in the choir. She tells the story that when I walked into the, in the room, something inside her left. You know, she goes, she didn't know it at the time, but I was the one. And I came in, and it was about 11 rows back on the right side. And it was a really, it was a really good choir, organ, brass, and cantata type thing. It was, it was all about peace. The guy who preached is the only time he ever preached a message in his life. 
And he ended the message with, with Romans 10 and said, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And he gave an invitation and they start to sing One Life. After the second verse, the guy who was leading the choir turns around and said, we're going to sing this one more time. I believe there's somebody here that God's been really speaking to. And the time is now if you're going to make a decision for him. And he turned around, the music started, and just something left with inside me, and I made a beeline down the, down the, you know, down the aisle, and uh, one of the musicians met me, took me by my hand, led me off to the side, and went through the Romans Road with me, and shared how I could have the Savior. And man, I was transformed. I prayed, and I cried, and I prayed some more, and that, that, that morning, that Sunday morning, um, September, Labor Day weekend, September 4th, 1977, I was born again. Story didn't end there, it goes forward, because you see, I was at a party hardy frat house. My roommate and I, we had over 400 lovely, beautiful bottles of liquor. We were the Thump Brothers. I mean, you know, if you wanted to have a party and there was thunder and lightning, we brought the thunder and lightning. That's just my, my buddy, John, and I. And I went back to campus that day, and I, John said, there's something different about you. And I un unpacked and unpacked my crux sack and put a Bible on my desk in the room, and John goes, what, pray tell, are you doing with that? Because that's totally out of character for the Chuck Kiefer right now. Excuse me a second. I said, John, I, I don't know quite how to say this, but I accepted Christ as my Savior this morning. And we started this conversation. Where it was the move-in weekend, and you know, we've been in the frat house for a while. We're doing our thing, and we just start talking. Bible on the table, bottle of Bailey's, bottle of of good Russian whiskey, uh, vodka. We're making black Russians, drinking, talking about Jesus. <laughs> I didn't know any better. <laughs> you know, I thought Job was Job, you know, seriously. I knew nothing other than the fact that I met Jesus and that I was forgiven. Knock on the door and in walks my buddy Rich. Rich was a grad student. He, uh, he was different than the rest of us. Uh, he was really a devout believer. He was also into the navigators. He was really big on memorizing scripture. Richie walks in and looks at the bottles and looks at the Bible. He said, something is really out of place here. And I stood up to Richie and said, Richie, I got saved today. Man, he, a little guy ran over, hugged me, and jumped into my arms and just gave me a big old bear hug. He goes, I'll be right back. And he ran out the room. You hear him thundering up the steps to his, his apartment in the frat house. And he comes running down with his Bible, big old Bible. And it's all dog-eared, it's got tabs, and it's got markers, and it's got notes falling out of it. I mean, this well-worn Bible. He, said, and he just sat down, and for the next five hours, we moved from the, uh, the living area to our kitchen. We, put a, we started drinking black coffee. The Jerry Lewis telephone is going on in the background. And come 5, 5.30 in the morning, the three of us kneeled down in that kitchen, and my roommate, John, invited Christ into his heart. Next morning, the missionary that I met at church that, that the day before, Ennis Pepper, calls me. Ennis goes, we're going to play volleyball today. By the way, that's the day I met Tim Pierce. Okay. Uh, we met, I'll tell that story in a second. But I, I said, Ennis said, how you doing? I said, well, I've been up all night, and I led my roommate to Christ. He's going, you did what? <laughs> so we went out to this picnic. Um... John and John, I was tinier than John in those days, and we were playing volleyball, and Tim was on the other side, and Tim was smack talking, and I went up to slam a shot down on Tim, and my hand got caught in the net, and I ended up pulling the net down and landing on Tim, and that's how I met Tim Pierce, our, our mutual friend. Never quite, he never, his bride, Teresa, never quite forgave me from trying to crush her future husband, you know. Um, but the long story in short was, I came to Christ, and it meant something, and it was real. And God 
went out of his way to find me. He wasn't going to let this angry, hurtful kid, this hollowness that I had in my chest, this lack of peace, this warring faction, this emptiness was immediately filled by the love of God. And I couldn't contain it. I couldn't keep my mouth shut. I was noisier back then. I was also more unruly because I was not skilled yet in Scripture. Our little Bible study of six people in the frat house grew exponentially to 200. And we had to move to the Student Union Center because we outgrew our little apartment. But I was a madman. John and I were just, you know, we were frat brothers. We'd go out and just talk to people about Jesus. I'd go to the bus stop for South Campus. And the bus would be pulling up, and I'd be talking to a crowd. And I'd say, you know, if somebody pushed you out in front of that bus, do you know where you'd spend eternity? Well, all of a sudden, I was the only person getting on the bus, you know? <laughs> I, I was a bull in the china shop. I, just, I was just so grateful for what I found. Two verses in Romans I want to leave you with. One, Romans 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Christ, we can have a relationship of peace with God. If you don't have it, you don't have to leave this place today. You can have it. And Romans 8 has been a life verse for me. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels or demons, neither the present or the future or any powers, neither height or depth or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. I am totally convinced of that. I will go to the grave uttering those words. We have something. If you have met Jesus, you've, you've got it all. He says, I'll bless you tenfold, fortyfold, hundredfold. And yeah, in this life you'll have tribulation. Yeah, stuff's going to happen. Don't believe the lie of the televangelists that say, Oh, the sweet by and by, oh, it's going to be perfect. God's going to bless you. You'll have riches in this and that. No, you won't. You'll have trouble. But you have joy beyond belief. <laughs> I could be so happy in misery because of who I met and who has changed me and who has blessed me, and who has encouraged me. It's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Amen. So what's your story? Have you met him? My crossroad was a TV set with Harry Reisner and a bunch of stupid kids wearing really ugly buttons and hats that set me off. And I called God out. I brought a water pistol to the bazooka fight. God was serious. And he took me at my word. And he proved that he's real. He's real. Oh yeah, he's real. It's not a game. It's not a game. It's real. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We are so blessed by your presence in our life and how you hunted us down. How you've had your way with us. You changed us and molded us and shaped us and spoke into our lives. You redeemed us. You dusted us off. You washed our faces from the mud of life. And you changed us forever. Thank you for the joy that comes in the morning. Thank you for transformation. Thank you for redeeming me. And I pray for others that they would find the same answer in Christ's name. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.